organizers of the meeting, I'd like to thank all of you for being here. Uh, I'm going to switch gears and talk about how sleep is controlled. So as many of you already know, uh, sleep is an essential innate behavior. As far as we can tell, all animals sleep, including flies and worms and even jellyfish, with only a simple primitive kind of nervous system. For non-mammalian animals, uh, sleep is usually detected by a lack of movement, right? So they stay still for a while. They show no motor response to sensory stimulation. For mammalian animal studies, we measure EEG and EMG. So during sleep, there is a clear reduction of skeletal muscle tone. And then based on EEG, we can distinguish REM and non-REM sleep. For humans, we measure EEG, EMG, and also these other things like heartbeat, uh, breathing. So during sleep, uh, we basically shut down somatic motor activity. We also slow down a lot the autonomic motor activity. Now the point is that falling asleep is not just about changing the brain state, it's also about reducing these different types of motor activity. So my lab has been studying how sleep is controlled, and I hope to convince you today that a lot of the neurons controlling sleep are really part of the motor circuits controlling movement. Pioneered by Moruzi and Magan, who discovered the ascending arousal system, we know a lot about the uh, wake system. So uh, these include the monoaminergic neurons, the cholinergic neurons, and some peptidergic neurons, the most important one being the uh, hypocretin system. But we know less about the sleep control mechanism. Uh, according to the textbook, there's a single sleep center in the mammalian brain, and that's the preoptic area, POA where a, uh, a subset of the neurons promotes sleep by inhibiting a lot of these wake neurons. And indeed, uh, using ret retrograde labeling from some of these wake neurons, we were able to identify some of the sleep neurons in the POA. But that's far from the whole picture. About four or five years ago, uh, several groups, including us, have found some sleep neurons outside of the POA, suggesting that the mechanism is much more distributed. So to get an idea of what the entire control network might look like, we did a whole brain screening for sleep neurons. We have two basic criteria. First, they need to be sleep promoting. Their activation should increase sleep and their inactivation should decrease sleep. Second, they should be sleep active so that they need to be active at the right time to do their job. And for screening, we have two corresponding strategies. We could either screen for sleep active neurons and then see if they're also sleep promoting, or we can search for sleep promoting neurons and see if they're also sleep active. So I'm gonna give you an example of each strategy today. To screen for sleep active neurons, we use a technique developed by uh, Li Chun Luo's lab called False Trap. So this was done by Zhe Zhang, a former postdoc, and Peng Zhong, who's actually here at the meeting. So we cross two mouse lines together. Uh, one of them uh, expresses CRE-ER under the false promoter. So we know that the active neurons, their false should be turned on, so they should express CRE-ER. The other mouse uh, expresses GAP in a CRE-dependent manner. So we divided these mice into two groups. Uh, in the SD group, uh, we injected tamoxifen during sleep deprivation so that the wake neurons that are active during uh, the deprivation period should express CRE-ER, and then tamoxifen should cause the CRE-ER to enter the nucleus and turn on GAP expression in the wake neurons. And then for the RS group, we first sleep deprive them for six hours, and then inject the tamoxifen during rebound sleep to label the sleep active neurons. And when we compare these two groups of mice, we saw many brain areas with different GAP expression, some of them show more GAP uh, in the RS group, and some uh, show more in the SD group. Now, if we look at this area with the highest relative expression of GAP in the RS group, right? so these are the putative sleep neurons, um, it's shown here. So this is basically the ventral region of the periaqueductal grade the pack. Now, even though uh, there are a lot more GAP neurons in the RS group than the SD group, there's still a, just a small minority of all the neurons in this region. So we have to figure out who they are. And for that, we did gene profiling. So the reported mouse uh, we used expresses not only GAP, but also this ribosomal protein L10A that's normally attached to mRNA for, uh, for translation. So if we use an antibody against GAP to pull down uh, L10A, we can also pull down the mRNA for sequencing. <clears throat> 
So here, uh, each dot is a gene, uh, and then this axis shows the expression of the gene in the putative sleep neurons relative to this entire chunk of tissue, and this is the p-value. So this red box indicates the genes that are highly significantly enriched in the putative sleep neurons. And we decided to focus on neuropeptides um, because one, uh, we know that the peptides are important for signaling. Two, there are just a lot of Cree lines uh, associated with peptides. So among the three neuropeptides in this box, um, CALCA, which is calcitonin gene-related peptide alpha, shows a substantial overlap with GAP labeling of the putative sleep neurons. So, so we decided to focus on the CALCA cells. Now first, we need to make sure that these neurons are truly sleep active because FOSS is actually not the perfect indicator of neural activity. So we did recording. We optogenetically tagged these CALCA neurons uh, using channel adoption using a CALCA Cree mouse um, made by uh, Richard Palmiter's lab. For recording, we use optode, uh, so there's an optic fiber surrounded by electrodes. So here is a unit, and you can see that every time we turn on a laser briefly, the little blue dot, this neuron fires reliably at a short latency. So we're pretty sure that this is a neuron that uh, expresses channel adoption, therefore it's a calca neuron. Here's a longer recording. Uh, this is the EEG uh, spectrogram, the EMG trace, and the color-coded brain state. So this neuron fires at a higher rate during non-REM, right, the orange periods, compared to both wake and REM. Here's a summary of 30-something calca neurons. Uh, each line is one neuron. We also summarize them in this plot. So this axis is the firing rate difference between non-REM sleep and wake, and this is between REM and wake. So the blue identified calca neurons are mostly on the right-hand side, so these neurons are more active during non-REM sleep compared to wake. But the gray unidentified neurons recorded in the same area, many of them are on the left, so these are wake active. So based on this, we know that these calca neurons are somewhat special because most of them are non-REM active, so this is one of our criteria. Now, are they sleep promoting? So first we did uh, optogenetic activation through channel adoption. This is a typical experiment. Uh, we turn on the laser for two minutes uh, per trial, the blue shading here, uh, every 10 minutes or so. And this is a summary of all the trials from all the mice that we tested. So when we turn on the laser at time zero, there's an immediate increase uh, in the probability of non-REM sleep and decrease in both wake and REM sleep. When we inactivated these cells through the inhibitory option IC++, we saw the decrease in sleep and increase in wakefulness. And in addition to the sort of short-term optogenetic manipulation, which is just one or two minutes per trial, we also did uh, chemogenetic manipulations. The GQ-mediated activation caused an increase in non-REM sleep for about two hours after CNO injection. And the GI-mediated inactivation caused a decrease in sleep. So based on both optogenetic and chemogenetic activation and inactivation, we know that these neurons are non-REM promoting. So this is our second criterion. So just to quickly summarize, in our effort to screen for sleep-active neurons, we found that the calcar neurons in the ventral pack are non-REM active and non-REM promoting. And without showing you the data, I'll just tell you that these neurons are actually glutamatergic. And now I'm going to switch to the second approach, which is to screen for sleep-promoting neurons. We did this based on a very simple logic. So we're going to start with the wake-promoting neurons. We know a lot of them. And we're going to use retrograde tracing to find their inhibitory input. Because if you're a neuron that inhibits wake neurons, then perhaps you can promote sleep. And then once we find the inhibitory sleep neurons, we're going to trace one more step back and look for their excitatory input. Because if you excite sleep neurons, then perhaps you're a sleep neuron yourself. So this screening was done by Chen Yan Ma, who's actually here at the meeting. So Chen Yan uh, targeted a whole bunch of wake-promoting neurons. And she looked for brain regions with relatively broad GABAergic inhibition. So these are the wake neurons that Chen Yan targeted, uh, including histaminergic, uh, noradrenergic, uh, cholinergic, glutamatergic, and gabergic neurons in seven brain areas. And these are the areas with relatively broad GABAergic uh, inhibition. So that includes the POA, right, the textbook sleep center. 
But Chen Yan also identified a subset of cells in the CEA, the central nucleus of amygdala, that are both sleep active and sleep promoting. In fact, her work has led to the identification of a very broadly distributed network of neurons that all express the peptide neurotensin that all pr uh, promote non-REM sleep. And if you go to her poster, she's going to tell you all about it. But today, I'm going to focus on this third region, uh, the SNR, substantia nigra pars reticulata, which is characterized by Dan Chen Liu, who's also uh, presenting a poster. So some of you might know that the, the SNR is actually part of the basal ganglia controlling movement. So to understand how these apparent motor neurons can actually uh, be involved in sleep, we decided to take a closer look at the motor behavior. So in addition to EEG and EMG, we also added video recording. And our collaborators in Beijing uh, use deep learning to train a network for uh, image segmentation. So here's the image, and this is where the network thinks the mouse is. And with this, we can easily uh, extract some simple parameters about movement. One of them is translation, uh, the movement of the center mass of the mouse, and the other is total movement. And when we plotted these two parameters, we saw four clusters. The dark green cluster corresponds to local motion. The light green is all the non-local motor movement, right? grooming, eating, posture adjustment. The third one is immobility. And if we look at the EEG and EMG, there are actually two states uh, in this cluster, quiet wakefulness and sleep. So here I'm showing the EEG delta power of the four states. So the higher the delta, the less aroused the brain is. And this is the EMG uh, power. Now the point I want to make here is that these three green states, they're all wake states, right? So we tend to think of their difference in terms of motor activity. But in fact, there is also a clear difference in their brain arousal. Now, both quiet wake and sleep are immobility states, right? So we think of their difference in terms of brain states, but there's also a clear difference in the EMG power. The point is that brain arousal and motor activity are correlated across multiple behavior states. Now, when we looked at the transitions uh, across these states, they're not random at all. Now, if you start out in local motion, they always transition into non-local motor movement. We have never seen a case where the mouse was like running in one moment and bam, fall asleep next moment. It just doesn't happen. Like, we don't do that as humans. So if you start out in uh, non-local motor movement, they either go back to running or quiet wake. They don't fall asleep right away. So if we put these four states in a single chain, then most of the transitions are between neighboring states. Right? So this is the transition matrix. The diagonal means stay in the same state. Uh, above the diagonal means going down the chain one step at a time, and, and this is going up. The only exception that we saw is that occasionally they wake up and they go into movement right away and skipping quite wake for us. So we think that the reason why most of the transitions are between neighboring states is because both brain arousal and motor activity tend to change gradually rather than abruptly. So back to the SNR. It turns out that there are actually two types of GABA neurons in the SNR. When we injected the cream inducible AAV into the PV cream mouse, we mostly label the PV positive neurons in the lateral SNR. And if we inject it into the GAT2 mouse, uh, we mostly label the medial cells uh, uh, that are PV negative. So next, we record it from these two cell types. Here is the optogenetically tagged PV cell, and here's optical recording. So this neuron uh, shows a higher firing rate during uh, movement periods and less during sleep. And this is a summary of all the PV cells, right? So most of them are more active during movement and less during sleep. So these neurons are actually not sleep active. But when we look at the GAT2 neurons, right, so these neurons tend to be most active during sleep and less so during movement. And here I'm just sort of showing you the uh, superimposed population average of the two cell types. Now, when we activated the GAT2 neurons, we saw a huge decrease in both types of movement and increase in sleep. PV neurons have very little effect on sleep, and the most effect that we saw was a decrease in movement and increase in quiet wakefulness. When we inactivated the GAT2 neurons, we saw a huge increase in movement and decrease in sleep. And again, the PV neuron uh, have a much weaker effect. So quick summary, the PV neurons are actually movement activated, and their activation mainly terminate movement. 
So we think this is because the PV neurons are actually important for action selection. Because every particular movement that we make, we also need to suppress these other unintended movement. So that's why whenever we're making a particular movement, there are always some PV neurons that are activated to suppress these other movements. But the GAT2 neurons are different. They basically generally suppress all the movement and enhance sleep. Now, even though the GAT2 neurons are doing this, they're not causing any direct movement to sleep transition, which are not observed normally. Instead, they bias the directions of the natural transitions. So all these transitions above the diagonal, meaning going down the chain, they're enhanced, and the others are suppressed. And inactivating the GAT2 neurons also cause no artificial transition. Um, Oh, so sorry, I should say that we think that this explains why the same neurons can control motor activity and also sleep. Because when we look at this transition, we think it's motor control, right? This transition stop movement, motor control. But this transition, we actually call it brain state control. But in fact, these neurons, they really don't care what we call these transitions, right? All they do is to push the animal down the chain. And in fact, for each transition, they're both EEG and EMG changes. And when we inactivate the GAT2 neurons, there's also no artificial transition, but we just bias the transitions uh, in the opposite direction. We also looked at the downstream targets of these cells. Uh, the PV neurons project to the motor thalamus, the motor layers of the superior colliculus, and this region called the midbrain locomotor region. So all of them are motor regions. The GAT2 neurons project to these motor regions, and in addition, they also project to the uh, dorsal raphe, containing the uh, uh, serotonergic and dopaminergic neurons, and the locus julius with noradrenergic neurons. And all of these are important for brain arousal. And when we, um, act, uh, when we label the subset of the uh, GAT2 neurons projecting to the thalamus, we also saw their acts on collaterals uh, in the dorsal raphe and locus julius. And when we uh, label the neurons projecting the dorsal raphe, we also saw their axons in the, in, the motor layer, uh, in the motor regions. So basically, it's the same population of neurons that send axon collaterals to both the motor regions and the brain arousal control regions. So here we have a GABAergic population. And as promised, we're going to uh, trace one more step back and look for their, their excitatory input. It turns out for the SNR neurons, the strongest excitation came from the STN, uh, the subthalamic nucleus. And when we activated these glutamatergic neurons, we also saw increase in sleep and decrease in wakefulness. So at the beginning, I said that uh, falling asleep is associated with changes in brain states and the reduction of motor activity. So it kind of makes sense for the sleep circuit to inhibit the brain arousal system and also these two types of motor control systems. So I told you that the STN SNR pathway promotes sleep, and they're an important part of the basal ganglia motor control circuit, right? So they're important for somatic motor control. I also told you at the beginning that uh, in our screening, we found sleep neurons in the periaqueductal gray. And in our other screening, which I didn't talk about today, we found sleep neurons in the amygdala, the hypothalamus, and also the nucleus of the solitary tract. And all of them are important nodes of the central autonomic uh, motor control system. So instead of being separate, right, implied by this circuit, um, the sleep mechanism seemed to deeply infiltrate both of these motor control systems. So now I move the sleep neurons into these motor boxes. On the other hand, the general state neurons could be separate from the specific action neurons, right? So in the SNR, the PV neurons are the action selection neurons, and the GAT2 neurons are the general state neurons. And these general state neurons send axon collaterals to both the uh, arousal system and the motor control regions to coordinate the arousal and, and motor activity. Now, we think that this kind of view of how sleep is controlled also has implications for the question of why we sleep, which Chiara addressed um, earlier today. Now, we tend to think that sleep is mostly about changing the brain state, right? So we shut off sensory processing, we lose awareness of the environment. 
But the fact that the sleep neurons are so closely associated with motor control suggests that equally importantly, sleep is about shutting off uh, motor activity, perhaps to promote processes fundamentally incompatible with movement. So we don't know what all those processes are yet, right? They probably include synaptic homeostasis that Kiara talked about. They might also include something as basic as cellular repair, right? To repair damages accumulated during movement. Now, to be clear, I don't just mean muscle damages caused by exercise, which, by the way, is a very important function of sleep for athletes. But for people in this room, um, we're kind of mental athletes, right? I think that neurons also accumulate damages uh, during prolonged arousal, and they need to be repaired uh, during sleep. And that's something we're looking into right now. And finally, these are the people in my lab who actually did the work. Zhe Zhang has left and is uh, running her own lab in Shanghai. <coughs> Chen Yan, Dan Qian, and Peng are all here already for faculty jobs. And uh, these two are showing posters. Please go see them. And these three are early pioneers who joined me um, eight or nine years ago when I started uh, studying sleep. We also have many collaborators who helped us a lot. And thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, go ahead. Hi. If you induce, if you were to induce immobility, um, would you still see similar activation of both the GAT2 and then the PV neurons similar to what you have presented? So what do you mean by induce immobility, right? So for example, we could optogenetically induce immobility, and then the question is, are you doing it yeah, upstream right. or downstream of these neurons, right? It's, it's, but, but, you know, behaviorally, you know, th there are a lot of different ways of inducing it. Right. But do you see similar responses if you were to immobilize an animal, let's say? Um, I, I think if you try to immobilize them, they could be trying to struggle. Even if you don't see visible movement because you're constraining their limbs, um, then I don't think that these neurons would be shutting down because the neurons are still telling the muscles to do it, right? It's just that they can't. But if they give up, then uh, I would imagine that these neurons will probably stop firing. But yeah. we haven't tested that. Jan, I was, I was impressed by the machine learning, which seemed to discriminate quite well between the different groups. And you made the point that you never go from wakefulness. Have you looked at the orexin knockout mice? Because there, you'd, it would be nice if they were able to discriminate that and show you those quick transitions that you don't see in wild type no, mice. No, we haven't. Um, so uh, we actually were hoping to get to look into the orexin mice. And, and there were some early efforts. And we were trying to get it from some group. And, and we weren't getting it, but sort, sort of supporting reasons. But we should at some point. I think also that data is, is supportive in, in many ways with the gen, human genetic data, which in uh, GWAS shows that there are a lot of overlap between you know, some of the genes that control the motor system and sleep and insomnia. So it, I think uh, it's very interesting. I think that has been forgotten, the relationship between oh, movement Oh, I'm, I'm really and, glad yeah. to hear that. So yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. So we have uh, the next. Uh, is there any uh, other question? Go ahead. Do you think that this? Oh. Well, you maybe she will. You will. Do you think that these neurons that regulate arousal trigger activity at the POA at some point, or do you think they can independently induce sleep? to each other, right? Uh, you know, are they upstream or downstream of the, of the POA? Uh, we think that the PAD neurons uh, that I talked about earlier, that they, they might be upstream of the POA. But the SNR, uh, you know, the, the, the problem is that, you know, the brain has so many recurrent loops, right? So at some point, it's hard to know what's upstream and what's downstream. But we don't know the whole circuit yet. 